Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Football Lockdown Extra interview, which is the first of a two-part special. Part one is what you're listening to right now, and part two will come out tomorrow, or it's possibly already out, depending on when you're listening to this. For this Football Lockdown Extra, Scott took the opportunity to talk to Serie A commentator Richard Whittle, and in part one, Richard talks about his love for Italian football in the 90s, the one player he didn't see, and a famous commentary line that led to a meeting with one of football's genuine legends. Please enjoy, and do not forget, if you have enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe and give us a little five-star rating. So, Rich, welcome to, to Football Lockdown. I uh, hope you're well. Um, how's, how's the return of football in Italy been uh, since, since the return? And, and how has it affected your, your sort of day-to-day you know, working? Well, obviously, with football coming back, for, for Italy, it, it was a, a great thing uh, in one sense. It sort of like brought us back to a bit of normality. But it's not normal obviously empty stadiums and with with the lockdown the players as well they've felt it and we've all felt especially in Italy the first country that was hit in Europe so we were ahead of everybody and when we look back in those really dark months you know it was February when it started actually it was the 21st of February I remember it well it's a Friday evening and uh we're getting ready for the weekend's matches and then the news came through, oh yeah, uh, somebody's um, you know, contracted the, the coronavirus and we're all like, oh well, you know, maybe it was an, an older person because this was the news that was coming through, but it wasn't. It was a guy who actually ran marathons, was a, a very fit athlete. And the guy spent 40 days in hospital. Uh, at the time, we didn't know that. We were like, oh really? You know, and then it hit suddenly that weekend. It went, It went just, um, I can only say crazy, the maddest thing I've ever felt in my life, where it went from uh, basically we're getting ready for weekend matches to uh, lockdown within the 9th of March, we actually went into lockdown. But before that, there was a feeling was was pretty terrible here. And the, the thought was maybe we're going to lockdown beforehand and football sort of took a, you know, obviously a pack seat and the clubs were feeling it. We were feeling it as well. And, and then suddenly that was it. It all ended. It was like um, we commentated matches over the weekend. And then by the Tuesday, it was like, don't come back to work, stay at home. By the Wednesday, the government had said, everyone stay at home. Don't go out. Don't move. You know, so basically we're locked in. In Italy, we're like the majority of people. We live in uh, apartments, small, mm-hmm. generally small flats. So we were had to stay in there. Um, players, as you might have seen, uh, might have left, uh, flew out of Italy. It was it was pretty much it was pretty chaotic, and then it it just went into to lockdown. So long months with long long months without anything. Then when we came back, it was a uh, protocol for us, for commentators. We were commentating from um, the studio at very small boo- uh, booths. Um, we were in there with a the television, our headphones. And for each match, we've got the same booth. So it's got uh, Richard's booth for this match. Okay. And Richard goes to that match every, every match. is from there. And it's uh, uh, disinfected. It's... Uh, after every game, and then when I go back, it's uh, you know it's, it's it's brand new. I can smell the disinfectant going around. Oh god, yeah. And w- when we go in, we've got our temperatures are taken. We've got uh, I'll just show you here. We wear our masks all the time. When we go out in Italy, we're wearing masks. I know in the UK we don't we don't have masks at the moment, but this is our situation like this. I don't commentate with a mask on because I'm in the booth. But when I walk out and uh, interact with the, uh, the sound guys and the, the video editors in the studio. We've got our masks on and we keep our distance. So it is something that really for all of us, I think, is something we never expected. And it's pretty crazy times. But um, on the positive front, uh, we have football back. And in Italy, 
the, the protocol has been very good with, uh, with the clubs. And, and for the players, I'm sure it's been tough. We, we've been isolated from the players in the past. Uh, for so many years, I used to go to the stadium, commentate in the stadium. It was amazing. You know, and, and now looking back on those times, it was like another world completely when you see, see the stadiums now completely empty. Uh, apart from officials from both both clubs, uh, it's surreal. I mean, it's, the word has been used a lot, but it pretty is, it's very surreal, and it's had an impact obviously on the league. So, when we when we talk about the league itself, uh, the FIGC obviously followed the same protocol rules as as they did in Bundesliga. Um, has there been many players that have contracted COVID since since the return? Has there been any news around that? Well, since the return, there, there haven't uh, been any players. Beforehand, there were certain clubs were hit hard. Fiorentina were hit hard. Uh, Sampdoria were hit hard with uh, a number of players who contracted uh, COVID-19, plus a number of coaches as well. It's been a high-profile case, of course, was uh, Giampiero Gasparini, the Atalanta coach, who, uh, who said that he contracted COVID-19 ahead of the trip to Valencia, which raised a lot of uh, you know, pretty negative news around uh, Atalanta. But in his defence, in all our defences, we didn't know what, what we were getting ourselves into. No, of course. But uh, the clubs moved very quickly, isolated the players. A lot of the players you probably saw uh, and read about uh, their their trials and tribulations, and they were pretty, they were hit pretty hard. So this showed that the, this COVID nineteen is a very, very severe uh, virus. If you think that professional footballers, young in their twenties, are laid low by it. You can see like older people and the rest of the population, what, what an effect it has had on them. But fortunately, the majority of players um, were uh, negative when they've been tested. And the, the testing is like almost every day now with the players. There was a case at Parma. And again, this raises a, a question about the testing because there was a, a part of the Parma staff, a member of the Parma staff who was tested positive or at the weekend before the, uh, their match and then he was tested again and he was negative this yeah, it, a does, lot of it does raise some questions testing. certainly yeah it does certainly raise some questions about the testing if if on, on one hand he is po positive and on the next test is it comes back as negative definitely but it shows also that we our understanding of this uh, coronavirus, you know, we we don't understand it really. But the great thing I've found in Italy, uh, being here through the, through our like severe lockdown, and then seeing the protocols in Serie A in Italian pre, uh, professional football have been excellent. You say that we followed the the, uh, the model of the Bundesliga, yes, because they returned. Uh, before uh, Serie A. Also, I think maybe Premier League, Spanish League. I think all the leagues have followed similar protocols. Mm -hmm. But in Italy, it's been, been excellent. The teams in general, if they can fly to a match on the day, even if it's from Rome up to northern Italy, they'll fly, fly in the morning, stay at a, at a hotel, travel to the match, play the match, and fly back to where they have to fly back. Fortunately, in one, one sense, a lot of the teams are based in northern Italy, so they can travel in a day. So from Milan to Turin, it's easy to travel. Down to Sassuolo, it's easy to travel to mm -hmm. Verona, to Parma. You know, Bologna, Florence, you can travel. The, the uh, furthest team are obviously Napoli, and then you've got the two Roman teams. Then after that, most of the teams are in the north. Then you've got, obviously, in uh, Sardinia, uh, and Lecce also are, 
or slightly isolated, but in a, in a day they can fly, they can fly around the, the country. So it's been well organized, that has to be said. And that has helped a lot because there's a, a big worry if we returned and suddenly one team went down, if you've got three or four players or even, you know, one or two players go down yeah. with the, the virus, then suddenly the league might have to come to a halt. But fortunately, at the moment, every, all the protocols are working very well. So each week, there hasn't been that really massive discussion. There was a thing about Parma, obviously, but uh, again, the testing, the second testing shows it was negative. So very, very, uh, very strange situation. Yeah, sure. And I think it's worth touching on the point that because it's so easy to, to travel around Italy, that uh, it's, it's probably been a godsend, really, with, with so many fixtures still to be played. I think they returned on, what, what was it, match day 28 or 29? Well, well they had the, the catch-up and then they came back, yeah, it was a third, match day 28. And still a long way to go. Uh, I think with the, the rest of your role, obviously the Bundesliga has finished, Premier League finished about 22nd. We don't finish to the beginning of August that weekend. So uh, Serie A goes on a lot longer. And uh, the fact that they're playing twice a week as well, as you know, we'll touch on this, has taken its toll on, on teams and players, you know, we come back here and it's, it's, not, it's not normal. This, who, you know, Juventus out in front at the moment. Uh, whoever wins the league, whoever you know, finishes second, third, fourth, Champions League, Europa League, gets relegated. We're not in a normal situation. Of course. You know, when we think back there, it was, it was so far back that it's just difficult to, to even like, comprehend what it was like. There was still, you know, everyone was still in with a chance to achieve their objectives for the season. Now those objectives have gone out the window. It's surreal in every sort of sense of the word. Okay, so we're, we're, we're come back to sort of current state of, of Serie A and maybe touch on, on uh, the promotion chases from Serie B in a bit. Um, but what, what I wanted to kind of discuss with you is, is how did you get into Italian football, Rich? Well, it's one of the, like most of the things in my life, it was very much by chance. And I moved to Italy for the 1990 World Cup. I was living in the UK and uh, I'd never been to a World Cup. 86 was in Mexico, 82 Spain, but uh, I was a bit young really to go there yeah. to, to Spain. 90, it, it just by chance, it was like, Oh, the World Cup's on in Italy. I'm going to go and live in Italy. So at the time I moved there, uh, I moved ahead of time uh, and um, got a job teaching English, as most people do when they go abroad, <laughs> especially in their, like, in their like, uh, mid-20s, early 20s. And uh, I was living in Rome uh, when the World Cup was on. So it was amazing. I went to all the World Cup matches and just fell in love with Rome fell in love with Italy, and by chance again, this is a thing by chance, that a television company opened up in the um, early 90s in, um, in Rome, which was Saudi run, uh, it was the first uh, digital satellite television company in the world, and by, it opened up in, in Saudi, Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Italy was the closest country for the footprint for the, uh, the satellite to, to travel there to, the, to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region. Uh, and by chance, I met some, I just met some guys who'd moved from the UK out one evening, as you do. Yeah, of and course. Uh, they said, oh, Yeah, we're looking for some guy, you know, speak Italian, speak English. Yeah, we're looking. And that was it. I got a um, foothold in there and then just started out logging programs and getting involved and just having lots of enthusiasm and uh, being able to like chat a lot as well <laughs> like, yeah just that, that was it there was no no formal training in it and then the back in those days things were a lot different you know I think uh, nowadays it's much more structured but back then there wasn't uh, there wasn't the, the, the there was the international feed but it was very it, 
didn't go out that, I think there might have been two or three commentators. And basically, I, you know, I was the one put my hand up, yeah, I'll do that. And that's how I started. It was, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty like a lot of things in my life, it wasn't planned. And I never sort of like uh, decided that, oh yeah, I'd like to be a football commentator. Of course I'd like to be a football commentator, but I never thought I would. And basically from there, it uh, sort of developed where I made my contacts. And then from there, there were more opportunities just opened up. I think back then there was a lot more opportunities, especially for the world feed, because it wasn't something that uh, anybody really, you know, when you said, oh yeah, I'm the, uh, I'm the footballer for the, uh, excuse me, I'm the commentator for the world feed. People go, all oh, right, okay. But it's not like you're working for the BBC, Match of the Day, and then later Sky, and what have you, ITV. It's nothing like that in the UK. You know, it's something that was left as a bit like being the, um, you know, the, uh, your correspondent from yeah. some isolated country <laughs> away, you know, reporting back to the UK. Although the, the World Feed never went out in the UK, it went around the world as, as it is the World Feed. So in America, suddenly I, I you know, got a, a good um, sort of like my commentary, very di different from what you'd expect from, uh, uh, you know, the normal UK commentary, which is pretty much, you know, serious down, down the line. I brought a little bit of my own sort of like... Um, off the cuff comments, and a lot of the time was um, at times was quite critical of the players <laughs> because I just felt you know I just I just decided well I'll just be myself you know I'm just um, uh, and from that also I started um, writing as well four four two football Italia magazine writing about Italian football and developed from there and it was like it's um, you know one of those things that's just snowballed. And suddenly I was in the, right in the middle of this avalanche of work because there, there weren't a lot of um, correspondents in Italy at that time. There's Paddy Agnew who uh, wrote for World, uh, World Soccer. Uh, but apart from that, there, there weren't many. Obviously, there was James Richardson with the Channel sure. 4. Of course, that was massive. Yeah, of course, yeah. And, you know... Uh, you know, I was friends with James before I got into to really the commentary. I was working with the, the, the TV, uh, the TV company. I was doing more reporting and uh, interviews at that time. But uh, obviously, the you know the, the heyday was you know with the Channel Four back in the UK. But uh, my way was a little bit bit different uh, and getting into to the world feed because. It was offered to broadcasters. If you think broadcasters maybe um, in the States didn't have the commentators who were actually at matches in the stadiums in Italy. So they're like, oh yeah, great, we'll take that. Uh, in South Africa as well, and Sub-Sahara in, in Africa or in other countries I think of where they, they didn't have the commentators, but they had a lot of TV stations broadcasting Italian football, Asia as well, obviously. And, and then from there, it, it developed with BN Sport, came onto the market, and they used the international feed, my commentaries, uh, for a long time and still do, uh, because they had the English channel and obviously the Arabic channel. So the two channels vying with each other within the Gulf region. So that was again, it just expanded from there. Sure. And and you you mentioned world feed. And am I am I right in thinking that uh, as a commentator for, for world feed, there's there's certain points in games where your 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 start a new sentence as such for for different broadcasts broadcasters to basically plug into to where their action starts from is that right well this is it it's a, it's a bit of a juggling act where, where you come in because with, with broadcasters they might have ads leading into the game they might start when the match kicks off they might start in the tunnel 
So you've got to be aware of each situation. So you do have your cues when, when it goes live, it goes live 10 minutes before kickoff. And we know that because it goes to the high shot of the, the stadium and we can come in and we can come in with a general sort of overview, welcome to the stadium, the match day, what the situation we're in. But then we don't know if after that broadcasters go to back to the studio, if they go to, to ads, if they haven't started. A lot of them like to come in when the players are in the tunnel. No, we're not seeing that with the COVID-19 situation we have because the referee walks up, referee and his officials walk on, then you see the away team walk on, and then the home team. But in the past, at big games, such as at the San Siro, the camera would be, uh, they'd have a camera in the, the tunnel, which is a great, you know, atmospheric moment beforehand, tension before the game. So then you've got to, obviously, talk around that. You talk around this player, you know, you see the players hugging, they know each other so well. This is the moment the players are waiting for. They just want to get onto the pitch. So then, once the players walk out, you might leave a little pause in your commentary because a lot of broadcasters go quick to a commercial break and then as the teams walk out you want to be on your on your game so you're back in there so here we are San Siro tonight you know and you're really and then you're into your commentary then after that it's the match commentary whatever happens and then when it comes to half time it's you know that a lot of broadcasters go straight out, so you don't have a lot of time just to round up the score, a little bit of the action, maybe who scored, talking points. We'll be back up. We'll be back. We, well, we don't even say that. We don't even say that. We're back to say, <laughs> give the final score, uh, the halftime score. So it's 2 0 to Milan here in this uh, Milan derby. What a match to be. Boom, you're out. And then that's how it uh, works. You've got to, it comes through experience because you know where where the broadcasters might come in looking at the camera angles. Obviously, with the situation we are in now, it's completely different. As I just explained, with the the teams walking out, you know, even for the players, you can see it. It's it's so it's so you know. Nothing that they've ever. It's just different, uh, isn't it, Rich? It's just different. It's for... more than different. It's it's it's. I I keep using this word surreal, but it is because the players walk out and they're looking around. Maybe a little bit unprecedented, then a little bit. And we've never had this. It's in never our happened lives. before. No, it's never, never happened had this before. in our lives. Players are walking out, and you generally you, you know yourself. You see the players walking out. They're concentrated. Their heads are down. They're you know they're focused. They're ignoring the cl- the crowd. Yeah, you never see players looking around at the crowd. You know, you always see them focused on their A game. Now you're seeing them walking out, looking around. Now they're becoming a little bit more used to it as we've gone through the match days. But in the beginning, you saw you saw some of the players walking out, and they're like, "Wow, this is this is not the you know what we've what we've ever been used to." No, because the players feed off the crowd. I've been at so many, commentated so many matches. I feed off it as well as a commentator. I did when we were, when we were at the, the stadiums. It was a, just amazing because the players walk out. The, the anthem of the home team is resounding around the ground. You know, we're talking about the big grounds, you know, Olympico, San Siro, Juventus Stadium, uh, San Paolo for the big matches. And you really feel the whole stadium is shaking and you feel it as well. You start feeling it through your like your whole body, and it, and you then become uh, on your A game. I'm not saying like we're now in this situation where we're so far from the stadiums and small booths that we're still not giving everything to the matches. But there's nothing like being at the stadium as a commentator. So I can only imagine what it's like for a player walking out to a full stadium and what it is now. Yeah, I'm sure. So you you mentioned that uh, when you moved to Italy, your your first destination for for living was was in Roma. Uh, you 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 obviously become a Romanista because I I know for sure that you are a big Roma fan. Um, t- tell us a bit about that. 
Well, how you ended up? How you ended up picking Roma and not Lazio? You go. Well, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, uh, before I moved to Roma, I knew well. I knew about both both clubs, Lazio less, so but Roma I knew through uh, you know their, their their big players, Falcao, like eighty two World Cup, Brazil. It's like wow, you know, watching as a, a kid, uh, Bruno Conte. Italy won the World Cup and with a pretty pragmatic team, very Italian pragmatic team, but Bruno Conti was like, who is this guy? Unbelievable place for Roma, all right, okay. And, you know, so I was aware of it, but obviously when I moved to, to Rome, I was a, a pretty young guy as well. And uh, when, when, when you move there, when you move back then, you know, it, this was 1990, February 1990, to move abroad was a pretty big thing, you know. I, I, for me, at that time, I didn't think it was, I just moved. But looking back, it was a pretty, you know, uh, major move because back then we didn't have all this the connection we have now through okay. social media and cheap flights to go, you know, to go, go back home. It was like, you know, it's like pretty, like pretty difficult. We always used to have to get the Air Kenya flight that arrived in Rome to go to London. And then I had to get to Belfast after course, that. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was, it was something you did. You just didn't do on a, you know, decide, Oh yeah, tomorrow I'll go. Uh, we've got all the um, low cost airlines. We can go back, you know, anywhere in the world or go back to the UK easily. But um, when I got there, you know, you did feel like, well, I've entered another world. You know, it was a beautiful world. I fell in love with Rome from the moment I arrived. I remember it was a, a February, you know, leaving rainy, wet UK in the middle of winter to arrive in Rome where it's 18 degrees, the sun was shining, people were sitting around having coffees. The women were beautiful. Everyone was beautiful. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I've arrived in heaven. And then I met some guys who are like big Roma fans. Oh, you've got to support Roma. You've got to be like, I don't know. okay. You know, you know, at that time I was pretty like, not that um, uh, I was looking to support one team or the other, but uh, it didn't take long. They, they took me to a match. Uh, uh, this was February. Nothing happens, you know. Romans are pretty, you know, they're pretty laid back when they say they're going to like, you know, take you to a match. So it got yeah. to March, and what was the match? It was the the Rome Derby. It was the Rome Derby in the the Flaminio Stadium, the small stadium which is across the river from the Olympico because the Olympico was uh, being renovated for Italia Novanta. And as I said before, my my main uh, thought was to go to all the matches as many matches as I, as I could at Italia Novanta because England were playing, uh, Ireland were playing. Uh, obviously, it was, everybody was playing, of course. Um, yeah, sure. Scotland were there. You know, Italy. Uh, by the time the World Cup came around, you know, I was really, you know, supporting Italy, obviously, because I really got into the lifestyle. But, you know, I went to the match. I had never seen any... any uh, this Rome Derby, you've got Lazio at one end in the, what was their, their Curva Nord, in the Flaminio, different situation, but Roma in the Curva Sud, the two, the two um, uh, stands behind the goal where the ultras go, and I was in the Curva Sud, and I'd never witnessed such just raw passion, colour, and something different from uh, which I have to say, back in the UK, sort of in the 80s, late 80s, pretty dreary, you know, with all the problems in the stadium, you know, in the, course, in the yeah. grounds in, the crowd in, trouble. in England. You know, it was, you know, a lot of you guys, you probably won't remember, like, what you call it, Thatcherites <laughs> England <laughs> at that time. You know, and football, everybody, you know, if you love football, you're, you know, you're tainted with, a, you know, a tar brush. Who, who loved football back then? I, lo I love the game so much. You know, I loved, you know, the, what the players did. You know, um, it wasn't going to matches in, in, in England. You know, there were worrying situations, you know. 
but you wanted, I wanted to watch the football and I'd always loved continental football, if you like, as we called it back then, European football. And then it, I was basically living a dream of going to, to, to games. It did, it cost nothing to go to matches. It cost probably about like five pounds back then to go to a match. If that, to go to a good seat, if you wanted. But I always went in the Kurva suit with, with the hardcore ultras. <laughs> now I have to say back then, you know, this is a, you know, a young Irish guy in there with these hardcore Romans, you know. And back then, yeah. you know, you had all the flares. They had a lot of problems with the police and stuff. But, you know, I just love the, the, the whole atmosphere of it. Plus... Everything on the pitch was amazing. Roma had, um, had Rudy Wuller playing for them, you know, the, the great uh, German striker. They had Giuseppe Giannini, Il Principe. He made, the guy was elegant on the ball, a long flowing hair. Everything was so different from what football was in England that you couldn't but help fall in love with it. And that was it. I was in love with Rome. It was like, that was it. I felt like I'd come to the place I'd always meant to come in my life, even in my mid-twenties. And, I'd, um, and I, then I just fell in love with Roma, and that was it. I really just became like the most like ultra Romanista that you could imagine. And I went to every match. I traveled away as well back then. You know, when you traveled away, it was like, sure. you know, you were herded onto the, on coach, onto, onto buses to be taken to the ground. And basically you were batten charged by the police in Italy back then. It was, <laughs> it was pretty raw. It was very raw, but at the same time, there was something about it that there was a romance about it that, you know, I, I'd never found anywhere else and from then you know I just became such a Romanista and Football Italia uh, magazine started around then as well in the 90s and I sent them an article I think about the Rome Derby and they're like oh yeah we love this so I started sending again it wasn't anything that was planned it just came from just by chance by yeah more what I felt when I was at the games I wanted to other people to feel the same way and you I wanted, wanted to people... express you wanted to express exactly what emotions it it drew from you yeah and, and I wanted to, I wanted to like maybe like my friends back in the UK which I'd left behind uh, and at that time you know you'd only send a letter or maybe call them like once a month even your family you didn't you didn't call that often you were isolated and I, it was an expression of like just how I felt and how happy I felt as well, even though Roma were like, you know, they're a good team, like in the sense that they'd get maybe to be in, you know, in the top four, get to, yeah. at that time, it was just that the top team went into the uh, Euro uh, European Cup, become the Champions League. And there was three teams in the UEFA Cup and Cup Winners' Cup. And Roma were like a cup team or um, UEFA Cup team. But that was a, also the romance of it. And plus, you know, Lazio were always, you know, I know they're a Roman team. I understand yeah. that. But they didn't feel like they, they were the city team. And I know this is like, will really annoy a lot of uh, Laziali. But I lived in Testaccio, which uh, any any uh, Roma fans or anyone who's lived in Rome will know that is a hardcore Romanista area. And back then, um, it was a very working class area. Now it's like cool bars, like everything in the world has become cool sure. bars and what have you. But back then it was very working class and they were hardcore Romanista. And, you know, that was it. I was, you know, I was gone. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and it's been like that throughout my life. And, like some people say, unfortunately, it's also going into your professional life. Sometimes when, you're when you were commentating the Roma matches, you got too carried away. And, you know, I accept that. And probably for a commentator, you shouldn't be like that. But then again, my route to being a commentator is very diff different from uh, the majority of uh, commentators in the world. Uh, and 
I just did what I what came from my heart, what I felt, and I think probably like in the states, certainly in Asia, fans of any club they always appreciated that I was like pretty emotional about Italian football. It wasn't um, like I was watching it from a distance. I was involved, and uh, you know, I started to really get into Italian football and it wasn't just Roma I, I, you know I knew all the, the players I, I lived there when there's a great Milan team you know it's incredible you know to yeah. see Van Basten you know uh, uh, Gullet, uh Maldini Baresi you know the only the only player I missed was uh, Diego Maradona unfortunately um, Roma had played their whole match in December so and then after Italian Avanta, Maradona's time in Italy came to uh, pretty much an abrupt end, as we've seen in the, the documentaries. But I was there and I saw him only on television. But he was the only player, I, you know, of that sort of, of that 90s that I never saw playing, which is, you know, pretty amazing. I've seen all the other the greats who played at that time in, in Italia. Uh, Serie A Italian football at that time was the best in the world by by far. Yeah, it, it it for me listening to you talk about your love for or or growing your love for Italian football makes me like close my eyes and think like how I fell in love and become a a rosso blue with with Bologna is you know you go to a place and you immerse yourself in the culture. And and you go to the stadium for that first game, and it just for me it just sucks you in, the the whole atmosphere, the way that the culture is so different to back here in the UK on match days, you know. Whereas I I always say in the UK it's very much about you know making money on going and having drinks, food, the the other things. Uh, what I find with Italian football is it's it's all about the football. Uh, and it's it's all the per, all, all a fan will talk about from the moment they wake up on match day to probably the moment they go to bed. Well, that's absolutely true. They, um, as I said, no, I'm I'm living in 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 Milan, and here obviously Milan and Inter are are the, the two the two big teams. Juve, you know, there's always Juve fans everywhere. Of course, <laughs> but. Um, and you know, I'm a bit isolated as a you know a Romanista up here in exile in northern Italy. But <laughs> for example, yesterday, you know, I don't know if still it still like makes me just like feel like amazing. I'm uh, in the bar having like a cappuccino in the morning, and th- th- there's two ladies, you know, like two middle-aged ladies having this massive argument about Antonio Conte. <laughs> it is incredible, you know. Do we get that at home? It was back. That was the thing. Also, when I first arrived, was where you know I was teaching English, and I'd be teaching, you know, like somebody like maybe a doctor or something, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm a bit, you know, I feel a bit down today. Roma didn't win, you know, <laughs> this kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, an accountant, and then you know, are talking about, um, you know, their their team, so." Then, then you've got like somebody who's like, you know, doing like another job, you know, and what people would probably call a normal sort of job. And they're sure. like, oh yeah, I couldn't even go to work today because, you know, they just live for football. And the bar culture, I talk about bar in the sense it's a cafe, okay? Sure. People come in, have their espresso. And then nine times out of 10, the whole discussion turns to football and that can be from the man on the street to the most powerful man in the country. The common denominator is culture, is your local team, the team you support. And it takes up most of the day for Italians (laughs) in discussion. That and what they're going to have for lunch and what they're going to have for dinner. They know how to live life to the full. And I was very, very fortunate to live in Italy, in a beautiful country, probably the most beautiful country in, in Europe, that's for sure, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Football crazy, crazy about food and living life to the full. 
and there's nothing better than you're you're there talking to some like you know it could be anybody like i said before middle-aged lady <laughs> you yeah, just don't yeah. expect it you wouldn't get it at home to this drop dead gorgeous girl who's like knows everything about the milan back four and what they should be doing what they shouldn't be doing you know for you know whatever whatever you say for guys like you know coming from the uk or whatever from ireland or wherever you know it's like being in heaven <laughs> and that's and it's never changed that's why i keep smiling no know? no you're always whatever smiling happens, Rich. you're always smiling <laughs> Whatever happens in the in the future with you know my, with my career, you know, because with the international feed things change all the time. There's new sure. rights holders. You could be flavor of the month one year, next year out, but it doesn't matter. I'm embedded here in Italia, uh, Italian football in Italy, and uh, you know, at this stage of my career, I'm just uh, you know, so. Uh, so grateful that I was able to enjoy some of the best times of Italian football. Like I said, to see some of the great players in their, their prime, you know, Roberto Baggio, Ronaldo, uh, Francesco Totti, to see them all live in the stadium yeah. playing football. That was just unbelievable, you know. So at, at this stage, you know, when, when we're talking about uh, uh, football in general in the world, uh, Italian football, in, a, in an environment that we, we've never been used to. We keep coming back to this because obviously this is the world we now live in and we're yeah. trying to accept it, um, you know, in, in the, these moments, you know, when I'm sitting quiet, I think, oh my goodness, I'm so yeah. happy I saw these players and was able to do these, to have these great moments. I want to I want to ask you about one particular player actually a, a player who for me um really got me into to Italian football and that was uh, for anyone that doesn't know his nickname is Battigol uh, Gabriel Battistuta what 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 was he like to see live when he, you know when he first when he first came to Italy well absolute raw talent just you know would turn quickly far off a shot far off a shot maybe from you know 30, 30 meters, run at defenders. I remember I went um, I went to Barcelona when uh, uh, Fiorentina played Barcelona Cup Winners Cup, and he scored at the New Camp, cracking goal. I think a lot of um, uh, English fans of a certain age remember when he scored at Wembley for Fiorentina against Arsenal. Way back, same thing. No backlift, just belted the ball into the back of the net, and long flowing hair. Everything about him was like, you know, the Lion King. You know, really was, wasn't he? he was mm. like, you know, a player that just, you know, uh, when when he got the ball, everybody stood up. I remember his goal against Milan in the the Italian Super Cup at the San Siro. We just hit. Cracking shot, ran into the camera, you know, was a showman as well. And obviously, uh, I remember when he came, came to him to Roma, and he, you know, he was the, obviously the, the catalyst in attack to, to score so many goals to, to send Roma to, you know, just to, you know, the third Scudetto in the, their history, but a Scudetto that's still talked about even after all these years in the capital. When will the next one ever come back? Sure. But he was an s- unbelievable player. Uh, and Roma got the best out of him after his... Um, Fiorentina is probably where, where he's remembered the best, I would, I would say, because that, that's where he really was at his peak. And Roma got the best one good year out of him, second year less. So then he went to Inter and then, you know, it's a lot of, then he had a lot of problems, knee injuries. And uh, obviously his career started to... Um, go downhill slightly sure. in the sense due, due to injuries but uh, certainly with Fiorentina it's just unbelievable raw strength as I said before turn quickly you know players balls played up to them and they suddenly turn and just belt the ball you know defences can't you can't defend against that no. you know? I almost think I almost and think he's uh probably one of the most complete strikers of his generation. 
Oh, definitely. You know, it, the way it would just, it would be there. And nine times out of 10, you would expect him to hit the target. And it, the power in his shot with no back lift was just incredible. And probably that, that's what probably wore on his knees eventually, you know, in the sense that his style didn't allow for him to have a long, long career, but it was a very explosive uh, and wonderful career. And everybody remembers, you know, like with from uh, Roma on the final day against Parma, when he when he when he scored those goals and the hair was flowing and you know the Romanisti just hold him in such high regard. But I I hold him a higher regard in one sense what he did at Fiorentina in a sense a smaller club, sure. very loyal to Fiorentina, stayed with them when they went down to Serie B as well, you know. That that's a, that's an amazing thing that the players you know generally wouldn't do a club like you know Fiorentina who had their their, their difficult times fell upon hard times but uh, he stuck with them and you know he's a massive hero there uh, and also also with Roma but you know you picked out there from the nineties again I'm so so pleased that I was able to see him in his prime. Oh, I'm sure. Well, if we if we go back to sort of your your commentary career, there is there is one particular quote that I know you're quite well known for, uh, which is the the King of Rome is not dead. Where where did the, where did that come from? Where does where did that stem from? At the time, well, it, you say quite well known. I mean, that's what I'm known for, really, especially um, with uh, with fans fans around the world. Uh, I'm not sure, so sure, like in, in the UK as much, but certainly in the, the uh, in America, North America, uh, Asia, and uh, Gulf region, and in the uh, um, uh, Africa, uh, sub-Sahara. Definitely, you know, a lot of people. I get a lot of uh, sure. tweets, and uh, people send me messages for that. And that basically, that that's I would say that moment that. Uh, that expression, that moment of joy, of raw emotion, made my career. Whatever happened afterwards, you know, would never be the same again. It was uh, one of those days when it was uh, the Rome Derby, and um, I was there commentating. In those days, we had two commentators on the um, uh, at the stadium. One would take the lead more um, for what was happening, passing the ball. Okay. And then I sort of grew into this sort of because, you know, I'd never stopped talking of like <laughs> of the <laughs> colour side of it. Yeah. And um, it was, the build up to it was was pretty, pretty fraught. Uh, and uh, Francesco Totti, who we're talking about, was having a lot of um, uh, uh, criticism, really, about his... Um, was he past it? Was he given enough for Roma? And this was coming from Roma fans. I'm not okay. saying Roma fans who remember what he'd done. He, he could have gone to Real Madrid, probably won a European Football of the Year, won uh, uh, championships in Spain, won uh, Champions Leagues, would have been superstar. But that's by the by. Um, he remained at Roma through thick and thin. And as we know, after the Scudetto, Roma, that was it. You know, they got close the following year. Uh, Europe never did anything really in the Champions League. Sure. Uh, won a couple, uh, couple of Cup Italias, ran Inter close. But by then, and we're going back now, what, uh, seven, eight years when this happened. Uh, you know, Francesco Totti was under a lot of, well, not a lot of pressure, but a lot of criticism. And it was very vocal. And I think it got to him as well. He couldn't believe that this was coming from uh, Romans, Romaniste, were turning against him. And I was like, come on, this guy's like done so much for you, like for your club. And in the build up to it, you never know what's going to happen in a match, do you? you know, no. It was a game where it was a March day and marching in Rome, it can be a beautiful sun can be. 24 degrees or it could be stormy it was stormy it was perfect it was like back in the days of the Caesars 
you know, stormy moments of something yeah. was going to happen. The clouds were over the stadium. Everything was just, the rain was coming down for moments and it was an intense Rome derby. And I don't know, like, maybe a lot of um, your, uh, your, your listeners or have been to, to derbies in, in Italy, but the most passionate for me is definitely the, the Rome derby because, first of all, there's a lot of hatred. They're just, and that's what a derby should be like. I use yeah. the word hatred, but it, it does go beyond that. Milan derby, you know, there has a certain... You know, there's not a hatred in it, but, you know, it, there's, it's a competitive edge. Turin Derby, well, you know, Juve are just always ahead of it. Genoa Derby is a bit more about, it's a bit more friendship, but very colourful. But the Rome Derby is raw passion. Yeah. And basically, it, you know, it came down to that. Totti had scored the goal from the free kick. Um, Rome were, were winning. Then they got the penalty. And he steps up drives the ball into the roof of the net, as I, as I said in the commentary, and runs to the Curva Sud. This was the Curva Sud where probably there were some fans 48 hours before where like saying, Totti's finished, he's had it. We're going just completely crazy. And from nowhere, it just felt, it just came out. In retrospect, there was something deep inside me, the king, you know, because kings, kings are, are held up in high esteem. They're fated. Next minute, they're taken down. Of course. And it just came out, the king of Rome is not dead, Francesco Totti. But that's it. The commentary went on. The match finished. I walked out of the stadium. Next minute, my phone's going <laughs> crazy. I'm like, oh what did you just say? You know, like, then my brother calls me. He'd been watching it back in Ireland. He goes, my goodness, people are like going crazy here. Like, well, what about, you know, like, what you just said, Francesco Totti, the king of Rome, you know, it's not dead. It's like, okay. You know, I was yeah. just feeling like pretty good about the commentary in Rome, everyone. Of yeah, course. Of course. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. So I was walking off and said, right, now I'm going for a pizza and a beer, relaxing. My job is done, you know, feeling great about life as you would, who wouldn't doing this job is just amazing. Then next my my, my Roman fan and um, Roman friends start calling me. Oh my God, what did you say? This is amazing. <laughs> and then I was like, okay. Then it sort of dawned on me. Like, I, and then my phone was just going crazy. So I was like, I can't answer any more of these calls because yeah. I was sort of removed from it. But then by the evening, all the, the, um, the Roman radio stations in Rome, the, the, there are so many uh, radio stations talking about Roma and Lazio, mostly yeah. about Roma. And they all try to outdo each other with the best um, sort of insight into Roma, the best, you know, the, the news, what's going on, but they're just everywhere. And all the stations were playing it. So like, by the time I got to the pizza, I could hear my voice <laughs> around, <laughs> around the pizzerias. I was like, what is going on here? You know, and it wasn't until really to the next day you know, on the Monday morning when I sort of like, you know, went out and then my phone went and somebody said, oh, can, can we interview on the radio? Um, Sky in Italy want to interview about this. Everybody's going crazy about this. And then suddenly that was it. It just it it uh, it was something that, that took on a life of its own, and it took on a life of its own even more because the following week, I think it was the body, um, Totti revealed the, the, the T-shirt, "The King of Rome is not dead." He said, "I love this quote, and I've got to meet this guy." So we met the last the last match of the season. If you remember back then, Milan won the, won the league, yeah. and they won it at um, at Rome at the Olympico, a nil nil draw. But which which was completely overshadowed by me meeting Francesco Totti, <laughs> <laughs> Milan winning winning the league and dancing around the stadium. But no one, none of the Romans were concerned about that. Oh, everybody, Francesco Totti wanted to meet me to to sort of see the face that had said, 
that um, you know saved his career. I'm joking, of course, it yes, saved his yeah. career. But you know, it, it, in a way, it brought him back into um, into the limelight. And it probably people have said to me um, said to me since then, you know, that it was a moment where also Roma fans really started to appreciate the final years of Francesco Totti as well to understand what a special player he was for the club and what they would finally miss when he left. There would never be another king of Rome like Francesco Totti. And as it turned out, the final, his final match, Totti Day, was an outpouring of emotion which mm. went right around the world, which I don't think we've ever seen for any other player on such a scale as we saw from Francesco Totti. But from then, that was it. I became known as, you know, the King of Rome. People call me the King, they call me the king of Rome, not oh, wow. me the King of Rome. But the good thing is, I generally, you know, um, I leave it to my friends. They do mention it. So we do get free pizzas in, in Rome whenever I'm back. So oh, really? <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always going to have that, you know. But um, when, when I think about it, it's it, it, it sort of like... It, Made my it made my career. Whatever came afterwards didn't really matter. It's made me um, the person that I am. Yeah. Very close to Rome. Very, very much in love with the city, even more so. And forever, I'll always be associated with that. Which you know, it's I'm not saying it's humbling, but it's something that really makes me feel emotional when I go back and and when. Somebody finds out, oh, you were the guy who said that. It and must, you it know, must be incredible. It hits home, it does, it does. It makes it does make me feel like you know, my heart does beat a little bit more. And also, you know, for the you know, it makes you feel good, especially uh, the fact that it, it was said with um, you know, a genuine honesty passion and yeah, honesty, passion and a love for Rome and for Roma and you know for Francesco Totti was my favorite player you know I saw him of course way he's, back he's in, the, in the 90s and you know I was like wow who is this kid and then it was also a beautiful thing as well which we don't see anymore it was a young kid from the city where he grew up the team that he supported you know becoming their icon, their hero. Yeah. You know, where does it happen anymore? Where will, we, where will we see it again in football? Of course. Have we lost that? Have we lost that closeness to our communities, to our cities that used to produce players that, uh, that the fans would then say is, is one of us? You know, I don't know if we'll, we'll see that again. And, and, you know, that was another thing that, you know, just made me like fall in love with him in that, in that football sense. And then to, to, to be able to go back to Rome and he's still held in such, it'll always be held in such high esteem by Romanisti. And if you're thinking now that well, Francesco Totti is what, 42, 43, and basically you've got, you know, guys in their 40s were kids when Totti was coming through and they've got there and they still tell their kids about Francesco Totti you know this is a bloodline that will go on and on almost like the Roman Empire and you know for me to be part of that it's, it's just amazing you know and I'm just grateful that's why I'm smiling <laughs> yeah I can see you smiling and, and I do every time you know I do every you know every time I think about it when people bring bring it up like yourself when you ask about these things I try to to encapsulate that moment and also give give a feeling of the passion of uh, of Rome of Roma of Italian football and how much they they really are just in love with their star players yeah here it, it's amazing it encapsulates the, 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 the Italians love of, of football it's it's just incredible. Well, it's, it's it's amazing to think that we could possibly have on the show tonight our most uh, iconic non-Italian Romanista in in Richard Whittle. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you know, it's, it's possible. What I've been through, I think so. You know, I've been from the, from the terraces to the, um, to the, to the commentator's uh, um, booth with Roma. Uh, you know, all you know, all all would make it. You know, for me personally, it would be amazing if um, you know Roma wanted a, uh, an English-speaking commentator. <laughs> you know, I'd be the man for the job. But you never know how things pan out in life. You you may be, as I said before, you you know, you're the fla flavor of the month uh, one time, and then as time goes on, it it changes. New people come in and you have to accept that. But for me personally, at my stage, my, my career stage in my life as well, I'm just so grateful to have uh, enjoyed Italian football when it was by far the best league in the world. Uh, and also not, not taken up by what we find now through the commercialism, television, which, which is important, but yeah. the terrace culture was, was, was incredible as well. Well, to feel that emotion, you know, to come, as I said before, to come from the UK, uh, you know, as a young guy and, and just feel like the, the raw Latin emotion, it, it's, it's something that uh, it has to be lived. And I think a lot of people you, like yourself coming over to Bologna, feeling that as well, you know, it's, it's incredible, as you know yourself, especially behind the goal there's no there's no roof there either so it's no. through in Bologna the weather isn't that great either so it's through the through the the, the you know the, the oh, sun the me. rain the snow whatever but you know you, you can relate to that you can relate to how you know still I think uh, maybe out of uh, South America Italy is still the, the most passionate uh, fan based culture in world football, in my opinion, anyway, uh, having witnessed that and obviously been back at matches in the UK uh, over the last few years, finding the difference from what I remember in the 80s, yeah. <laughs> certainly, having lived out of the UK for a long time as well, you know, you notice the differences, I think, um, when, when you go back, you do see that, but maybe people back home may not notice that, and um, certainly I've seen that also uh, uh, here in Italy, up to a certain extent, but I still feel that if you if you're coming from the UK, going to an Italian match, you 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 really get the experience, you know, of how close the fans are to to living it, yeah, as much as the players do. Totally agree. I think for me, it's uh, for whatever reason, I found myself in in Bologna, and uh, and made made some friends whilst I was out there. And and they do they 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 pull you in when you start speaking to Italians about football they pull you into conversation and I remember going to my first game, um, Bologna lost to Palermo, but I walked away from it knowing that I was going to go back again and again and again every time I go there on vacation it's always it must be a weekend when when Bologna are at home at the Dallara, um, it's it's just an amazing an amazing atmosphere. I think regardless of which stadium you go to, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll feel something, you'll see something different. Uh, it's something I would definitely recommend to anyone that does travel to Italy is to, uh, if, if, you're, if you love your football, and obviously our listeners that listen to this podcast do love football, that, uh, that you get yourself to a game if you can. Well, definitely. Um, of course, in our situation at the moment, we're hoping that, you know, we'll get back and, you know, the stadiums will be full again, but certainly coming over to Italy, you know, if if we take these last, uh, whatever, three or four months out of the equation before that, flights to Italy were cheap. Going to the, going to the matches are cheap in Italy. You know, you can get in, you can get into the Curva for 20 euros. You can get into a good seat for 50, 60 euros if you want. You can pay 40 euros. Um, you can have a, a wonderful weekend, um, enjoying Italian food, enjoying the culture, uh, enjoying the weather. If you come over for matches in the springtime, go to places such as Bologna, Florence. It's a, just a, a wonderful atmosphere. And still, you know, you know, the stadiums aren't up to, up to scratch, as you would see in maybe in the Premier League, Bundesliga, of course. But they do have that the charm. That's what I love about them. They still have that old charm. 
and you go to stadiums and you'll still see like the um, uh, you see the mascot from Italian Obanta still there. It's, yeah, you know, you know, you can't buy that. You can't buy that emotion, especially for somebody my age. I mean, maybe for younger people, they want to have that. You know, the, the stadiums looking good, but I, you know, I feel like a lot of the stadiums. You know, Juventus Stadium is is modern. It's beautiful and all, but you know, it's 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 too modern. It's too slick. I don't want to say it's soulless because you know it's not. It still generates sure. a lot of uh, good passion at the um, Juventus Stadium. But you know, I love going to you know Artemio Franchi mm-hmm. in in Florence. You know, you're out there on the edge of beautiful, beautiful Florence. Uh, below the hills of the Fusoli hills above you, and it's open like Bologna Stadium, like in Palermo. It's open on three sides. Yep. So the fans have to, you know, they've got the elements, whatever the elements are, they've got to deal with it. Oh, and, believe you know, me, I've been rained on. <laughs> and, and, and obviously, getting a bit of a, you know, a red face as well from the sun, you yep. know, as well. And, um, a lot of the stadiums are, are, you know, accessible from the centre of t- uh, of the of town. You know, uh, go go to Luigi Ferrari is right in the centre of Genoa. You travel right down. You come in through the tunnels into Genoa, with all like the, the the buildings on top of each other, and right in there is Luigi Ferrari's packed, hemmed in on all sides by buildings but generating an amazing atmosphere. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful trip to go to, to Genoa, Liguria, a beautiful part of Italy, to take in a match there. And again, you know, it's affordable. Uh, and I think it's, you know, you're going back, it's, you know, for, for fans coming from abroad, you're, you're almost going back in time and you're, you're, watching, you're watching football in its more raw sense. It's not commercialised. As it maybe might be in the Premier League, um, and it's still out there. And at the end of the day, it's very raw. The, pa- the fans are so passionate, and they, you know, they live for that moment. I know fans all over the world live for the weekend for their matches, but here, you know, the build-up to matches start in, you know, especially for derbies. Derbies start like two weeks beforehand. It's all they talk about, and the players are just if they go out, they, they have no chance. It's just kind of like you've got to win the derby, yeah. You know, so that's in in Rome, in Genoa, in Milan, in Turin, and um, it is it's you know, you know. Hopefully, I've conveyed some some of just the the passion and color of Italian football for you. It's um, for me, it's been a great uh, a great journey for me from you know innocent youngster to this uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> The wily old man, maybe, but uh, maybe no, not. Still, not at all I still ret- no, I still retain that enthusiasm. That's the thing I've retained for Italian football through the thick and thin of that enthusiasm as, and enthusiasm and passion for for Italy and uh, Italian football. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to another episode of Football Lockdown. Please, please, please make sure that you subscribe to get more episodes of Football Lockdown with your podcast provider of choice. And also make sure that you give us a rating, preferably five stars, as that would really help us to boost the audience. And if we boost the audience, that means that we can do more stuff and get more shows out to you. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. Search for us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, where we've got the pretty pictures on Instagram. Just search for Football Lockdown and you'll find us there. If you've got questions, then send them to our social media channels or alternatively, if you're still using email, it's footballlockdown at gmail.com. I've been your host today as always, Craig Shields, and it's goodbye from Scott, Mark, Stuart and myself, and we'll see you soon. Until then, we're out.